Well, praise the Lord. Amen. We're having a good good time in the Lord tonight, aren't we, brother? Amen. Had some good singing. We've had some prayer time and good visiting. So we're we're ready to go. Amen. And you have your Bibles. Yes. All right. You're gonna need Bibles. This is Bible study night. We're going to be what we're doing now, we've been studying the promises of God. Amen. Amen. Do you know God keeps his promises? Amen. Yes. Yes. God keeps his promises. Every time. Now that's something we really need to get a hold of and just understand and not forget that God keeps his promises. If he says he will do something, he will do it. Amen. If he says he won't do something, he won't do that. Whatever his promises are, God keeps his promises. So we started this series, and we are, I guess, a couple of, we're maybe two-thirds of the way through. So we'll just have a brief recap. God promised Abraham some wonderful and glorious promises. If I can... If I can stick to my notes here, and if I can read them, I don't have my glasses. But Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, God said to Abraham, or Abram, back then he was called Abram, I will make you a great nation. Genesis 12, 2. Genesis 12, 7, God said to Abram, to your seed will I give this Canaan land. And he restated it also in Genesis 13, Verses 14 and 15. Now I'm going through what we've covered already fairly quickly. And I may make several comments concerning it. But uh, we don't want to backtrack too much because it will take up our whole time. But Genesis 13, 16. God said to Abram, I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth. Amen. 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 And it's also restated in Genesis chapter 15, verse 5. Where he says that. Abram's descendants will be as the stars of heaven. Amen. Amen. And another place he says, as the sand on the seashore. Well, thank you. I will use them if I have to. But this is not my favorite pair. So what we're talking about is God makes promises to Abraham he says, I'm going to make, I'm going to give you all this land. I'm going to make you the father of many nations. It says here, my covenant with you, you shall be, in Genesis chapter 17, verse 4, you shall be the father of many nations. And the implication here is that he will be the father of many simultaneously existing nations. And he changed his name to Abraham. Abraham had had Ishmael by Hagar, but Sarah had not yet born any children. And then in the next couple of, the next letter in the chapter, chapter 17, verse 16, God qualifies the promise that he made to Abraham that he will be the father of many nations. And he says that Sarah will be the mother of kings of nations. Amen. Amen. Kings of people. Genesis 17, 6. I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. He said this to Abraham. So, these are great and glorious promises. Amen? Amen. All kinds of land. So many children. He can't even count them all in as far as his descendants. Because that's the implication. When he says, I'll give you, your seed will be as the sand of the earth. Uh, seashore and the dust of the earth and the stars of heaven who can count them all so these are great and glorious promises that God promised Abraham Amen. and that all of those promises collectively we call the birthright because it would go not from Abraham to Ishmael it would go to from Abraham to Isaac and then to Jacob. But let's, let's follow along here. In Genesis chapter 22 verse 17. God tells Abraham. Your seed will, out, will possess the gates of their enemies. 
It's also confirmed and qualified in Genesis chapter 24, 60, when Rebekah's brothers blessed her. <clears throat> so the birthright goes to Isaac. Amen. Yeah. Abraham, yeah. Isaac. What? <clears throat> Okay, let's just, let's say here, okay, Abraham's promises are what? Land, uh, his descendants would be as? A lot. Just a lot, yeah. Many, many, many descendants. Uh, he'll possess the gates, or they will possess the gates of their enemies. What else? Kings shall come from him, kings of peoples. <laughs> this is great. And, you, you know, we need to look at God's promises, and we need to say God will not. I mean, this is, this, it's just our premise. We believe that this is God's word. It's God's word. It's not man's word. It's God's word. It's God breathed, the Bible says. And we believe it. So we need to come to a place where we trust him. And if we can see that God keeps his word, that'll build up trust in our hearts for him, right? Yeah. Trust towards him. So when someone might wonder, you know, why are we uh, looking at these promises? They're, they're, it's really the basis, the foundation for everything that we're going to do from here on. So, uh, are there any questions so far? Any observations? Okay, where did I leave off? Genesis chapter 22, in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. So his descendants will be a blessing to all the inhabitants of the earth. Think about that. <laughs> This just gets better and better. There's a people on this, on this planet that God calls his special treasure. They are Abraham's descendants, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob, who was later called Israel. And uh, so we need to know what these promises are and who they are fulfilled in. Because let me just take a little brief time out right here. When we're talking about these promises, they're, I, I'm taking it from the presumption that God keeps his word. So if he makes these promises, we've got to look and see somewhere in the world a people that are possession of a lot of land, many, many land. They have descendants of a great, numerous, very numerous people, a people that is powerful, a people that has kings sitting on thrones, a people that have been a blessing to the entire world. Amen? Amen. Because God keeps his word, right? Amen. He says it's, he's going to do something, he's going to do it. We believe it. <clears throat> Genesis 26, verses 2 and 4, God said to Isaac, I will bless you. I will give you, I will give all these lands to you. Let's just... Read that. Somebody, uh, Brother Art, would you read Genesis 26, verses 2 to 4? And I'm not sure where we left off last week. Nancy, maybe you, or last time. Romans 9. Oh, okay. 9, 10, <clears throat> 10 through 16. All right, well, we got a ways to go. Okay, it's talking about Abraham here. Yep. And it says, And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee, and unto thy seed, will I give these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham my, thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. 
All right, now here we have a confirmation of some of the, the same, all these same promises, but it's like all here in condensed form. He says he will bless Abraham. He says he will give all these lands to him. He says he will multiply his descendants as the stars of heaven. He says in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Amen. Now look at the world and see, is there a people that this fits? Now, you know, Thomas Paine, he was one of our founding fathers. He's the only one that I know of that was not a professing Christian. And the reason why he said he wasn't, he said, I looked at the promises of God, the promises God made to Abraham, one man's family, solemn promises. And I looked at the Jews, and I said, either God can't keep his word, or he just hasn't kept his word, or else he's just not there. In any case, I don't want to serve that God. Now that's something to think about, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Right. I mean, you could criticize the guy, but honestly, if God says he's going to do something, he doesn't do it, can we trust him? The obvious answer is no, we can't. Right. Right. But if he keeps his if, see, we he was coming at it from, okay, I was just he was just thinking, okay, these are the people that everybody says is God's chosen people, but these are the promises. They don't fit. Yeah. Because especially back then, they were kicked out of every country in the, na in the world. They're not a nation company of nations. They don't have a throne anywhere. They don't, uh, they're not a, a blessing to the whole world. Uh, they don't possess the gates of their enemies. All of this, it just didn't fit. And so he said, they are not the fulfillment of God's promises to his people. He shouldn't have stopped there. He should have said, well, if they're not the ones who are. Right? Yeah. right? Amen. Yeah, God, we need to, we know, just, that, that's got to be our premise. God keeps his word. So these promises describe a people in the world today. A people that has great land mass, great land possessions. So many of them that you can't even count them all. They're in and many simultaneously existing countries and nations of these particular people. Yeah. Kings. There's a big clue right there. And that they were a blessing to all the people and are a blessing to all the people on the face of the earth. Amen. When there is a cataclysm, when there is a catastrophe anywhere in the world, who is the first people to show up on the scene ready to help? Think about it. It isn't the Jews. It isn't the Asians. It isn't the Africans. Who is it? It's our people. Amen. Now you'd study the history of our people and you go all the way back and trace our history. We've been Christian since the first century. I've preached in England many times and I've preached at a place. I didn't preach in Glastonbury, but I was at the home of an evangelist and he took me to Glastonbury Abbey. Glastonbury Abbey, the foundation of that place or the establishing of that church was 37. The year 37. Wow. Not one or two or three, 30, 37 was the year that that church was established. It's not the same building. In fact, the building that's there, if you look it up on the internet, Glastonbury Abbey, it's been in ruins since the 1500s. But it was built around 1100, and that church was built on, a, on the foundation of an even more ancient church. It goes all the way back to 37 AD. A Welsh historian took me to a place in Lantwit Major in Wales to a church that had been built also in the first century. And she took me into this room, and in this room, she just had this reverence, this look about her. She was reverent. She reminded me of my grandmother. And she said, Pastor, from this room in the first century, prayers were going up to heaven 24 hours a day in this room. In the first century. Yeah. Our people have been Christians since the very time of Christ. 
Amen. There's a reason for that. There's a reason why we are the ones who have been the custodian of God's holy word. Amen. All these years. I've been in the room in Westminster Abbey where this was, that we used the King James Bible here. I've been in the room where this Bible was translated into English for the people by the order of the king. The king, one of, I believe, one of the descendants of David who will go, we'll study on those promises here in a little bit if we have the time. But just think about it. Does God keep his promise? Does he keep his word? If he does, we have to know that there are, there's only one people on, you know, on the face of the earth that, keeps, that, that, that is described by these promises. Amen. Do you believe that? Amen. Yeah. If you do or don't, think about it and just you know, mull it over in your mind. There is a reason why we have been Christian since the first century. There's a reason why we're the ones who are the first to go wherever there's a problem, wherever there's a tsunami or a disaster of any kind. We are there. We're there with food. We're there with clothing. We're there. We're there. We're a blessing. Not to. I, please don't take this as being prideful. I, I'm just trying to exalt and lift up the Lord Jesus Christ and tell you that God keeps his word. And, and we, need to, we need to trust him. I believe this teaching, the purpose of it is to build our faith in him. Moving right along. Genesis 25, 23. God said to Rebekah, two nations and two peoples are in your womb. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Esau was born first and had the birthright, but he gave it away for a bowl of bean soup. And we read about that last time in Genesis chapter 25. Imagine having a birthright of this magnitude and giving it up for a bowl of bean soup. Pretty stupid. Can anyone be that stupid? Well, somebody was. But you know what? I have to say that God had already decided before either of them were ever born who would be the one who would receive his blessing. Amen. And we read that in Romans chapter 9, and I think we've caught up <clears throat> after that. So Romans chapter 9. Nancy, what were those verses in Romans chapter 9? Verse 12. Okay. Uh, Don Eva, you want to read? It's 10 through 16. 10 through 16. <clears throat> there. Or somebody, just somebody so, read. Uh, 10, 10 through 16. 9, 10 through 16. I would help if I was on the right. Um, well, let's, yeah. let's say verse 9 and following. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one, even by her father Isaac. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or any evil, or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. When am I supposed to stop? 16. Oh, uh, yeah, just keep going. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy, on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion, on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Yes. So here we have, uh, just very plainly, God's sovereignty. He's in charge. Let me just ask you this. If, if, if God isn't in charge, 
If there's anything in the world that can happen that God doesn't want to happen, he can't stop from happening, is he really God? You know, I happen to think that he's all-powerful. Okay. And this is, this is really very clearly showing us the sovereignty of God. He says, for the children not being yet born neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. What shall we say? You know, for someone, you know, it might pop into your head, well, that's not fair, but they say, he continues. He says, well, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Is, it, is he not fair? God forbid, for he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God, that showeth mercy. Amen? Amen. And then he says here in uh, Genesis chapter 28, verse 13 to 14, the land on which you lie... I will give you, give to you and your descendants. Your descendants, also he says, will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. And it says here, you shall spread abroad to the west, east, north, and south. It says here, in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So he's continuing on, reconfirming over and over these promises. Genesis 35, verse 11. God said to Jacob, A nation and a commonwealth of nations shall proceed from you. Kings shall come from your loins. The land which I give, gave to Abraham and Isaac, I give to you. So here he goes from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. Make sure uh, if they need any help. We sure are glad you came by tonight. Sorry. Sorry. Well, God bless you. Thank you for coming, and uh, hope to see you again sometime. I'd like to get to know you better. So Israel loved Joseph the most, Genesis 37, 3. And Joseph dreamed two dreams concerning his preeminence over his brethren. Genesis chapter 37, verses 7 to 9. And the dreams came true. Genesis 41 to 45. Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, defiled his father's bed and so did not receive the birthright. So we'll pick up there. I believe that'll be a good place to pick up next time. But are you, are you getting anything out of this? Absolutely. This study? Yes. Well, we praise the Lord that you've been here and that you uh, learn something, and we'll pick it up there next time. Genesis 35, 11. Let's just remember that. Genesis 35, 11. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your goodness to us, and we ask that you would please be with us and help us and give us understanding. In Jesus' name, amen.